Uh, welcome, my name is Peter, and this is a joint work with my colleagues from Masaryk University, as was said. And the question we are trying to answer is relatively simple. This is uh, ordinary RSA public key, nothing special about that. And the question is, which particular software library generated this key? And the good guess uh, would be OpenSSL, because so many keys are generated by the OpenSSL, right? But uh, uh, it can't be OpenSSL. OpenSSL will never generate a key like this. Uh, in fact, it was some Infineon cryptographic smart card. And uh, how we can know this? Uh, first, because we generated that key, right? But uh, there is a deeper reason. Uh, and the reason is that some bits of this public key are biased in a such way, so we can tell that it can be OpenSSL and it's probably uh, Infineon smart card. Uh, but how is that possible? Uh, the public modulus is just the result of multiplication of two uh, random primes, P and Q. So how it's possible that it's biased? And uh, there are, uh, these uh, primes are random. They are coming from some uh, random number generator. And in case this random number generator is biased, then the primes will be biased and the modulus as well. But this is not what we do assume. We assume that the random number generator is perfectly fine and yeah, no bias there and still the modulus is biased. And the responsible uh, thing for this is uh, crypto library code, which is responsible for generating, picking the uh, primes, yeah, P and Q. So what we did here? Uh, we first took a lot of software libraries and also 16 different cryptographic smart cards from six different manufacturers and uh, asked every source to generate uh, one million keys for us at least one million key pairs. So we end up with a large database. Uh, it was easy for software libraries, it's harder for smart cards, some were broken, but uh, after a few weeks we were able to get uh, that amount of keys. And with this, we got both private part and the public part, primes, modulus, and we ran a lot of uh, analysis on this. Yeah? We inspected different uh, uh, parts, and as a result, it turned out that there are at least seven implementation choices made by the developers of these libraries or smart cards uh, that bias some bits in a public key. And uh, what we can do with that? Yeah, so uh, one example, what, uh, what is the implementation choice that bias something in a public key is uh, printing the heat map of uh, most significant byte of primes. So we have the primes for the analysis part, and therefore we can take most significant byte from uh, the P, most significant byte from Q, uh, X axis is uh, uh, P, Y axis is Q, and then just plot it. For every key, we will get one particle point, but because we have million of these, we will get nice heat map. And uh, we were really surprised by the variability we saw. Yeah? This is just few uh, examples, but there are more. Yeah? So we were surprised. Uh, but this is still about private keys. And uh, for the classification of public keys, we don't have this. But uh, if the most significant byte of primes is biased, then after the multiplication, uh, of course, the modulus, most significant byte of the modulus will be biased as well. Yeah? And therefore, this matters also for the public keys. This is one example. Uh, an another example is uh, you can take... Uh, uh, RSA 512 bits that's insecure for ordinary use, but you can inspect that. And the primes there will be half length, and therefore what you can do is to factorize uh, prime minus one value, okay? And as a result, you will get uh, uh, these factors. Uh, so we uh, factorized uh, 10,000 keys from every source by Yafu tool, and uh, once again we saw different distributions. Here on the x-axis, is the length of biggest factor of P minus one. On the Y axis is the length of the second biggest factor. And if you have completely a random prime, a lot of random primes, you should see distribution like this one. Okay, this is expected for completely random prime. But instead, what we saw for some libraries was something like this, yeah, some gaps there. Uh, and it turns out that some libraries avoid small factors in this P minus uh, one uh, value. And uh, this will, in turn, uh, introduce some bias on uh, smaller bits, on lower bits of uh, public modulus. 
And this was, in fact, used already by Ilya Mironov to attribute some uh, weak RSA keys to OpenSSL library uh, before. Uh, if the library itself generates so-called FIPS primes, but there is a strict requirement that the prime value should be at least uh, 101 bit, for example, the, the biggest factor of the P minus one should be at least that length, you will see completely different distribution, okay? So this is another thing that uh, uh, bias something in a public key. And there are more of these. So what are these seven implementation choices? Uh, first, it's a direct manipulation of primes highest bits. Uh, this is a very significant thing that will significantly manifest itself also in a highest bits of a public key. Another example, uh, another factor, uh, is the avoidance of these small factors. This will bias the small bits of uh, of public modulus, again, very significantly. Uh, some sources, some libraries, and uh, cryptographic smart cards requires moduli to be blam integer, yeah, for not really a clear reason, but this is observable as well. Uh, some libraries uh, restrict and some don't uh, the length of the primes, and this will in turn impact the length of the modulus as such. Uh, some libraries uh, do not generate primes randomly, but instead of construct these to have a strong or provable primes. And this is uh, observable, not that significantly, but it's observable from the public modulus as well. Uh, for some uh, smart cards, we don't know because it's a black box for us. We don't have the code there, but it's doing something that is statistically observable. Uh, so, and even think like uh, what you will do if you will generate a random value and it will turn out not to be a prime. What you will do? Will you just discard it and generate a new random value or uh, will you add two and test for the primality again? Even thing like this is observable from the public key. Just slightly, but it's observable. So when we know that there are these uh, implementation choices that bias some bits of public modulus, we can use this for a classification. So we will start uh, during the learning uh, phase with a lot of keys, with our 60 million plus keys, at least a million from every source. And we already know from the previous analysis which particle bits are biased in a public key. So what we can do is for every source, we can apply this mask for particle key and get particle mask value, okay? We will do this over one million uh, keys and then count the frequency for different mask values. As a result, we will get some uh, histogram. This is the example histogram for three different sources and you can see that these histograms are different, okay? So we can distinguish between these three sources. Sometimes it will happen that uh, two libraries produce the exactly same or almost same uh, mask frequencies. And then we can't distinguish between these uh, two libraries and we will group these together into same classification group, okay? What is the result of this? After going through the whole learning set, we will get a classification matrix which contains for every possible, possible mask value and we are working with uh, nine bits, and therefore uh, two up to nine uh, uh, possibilities. What is the probability that particular library or group of libraries within the same group generated this mask value? Okay, and this is pre-computed from our large data set, and now we have this classification matrix. So what is the result based on this uh, against the, the keys we have? We started with uh, 38 uh, different uh, sources, libraries and smart cards, and we end up with uh, 13 classification groups. Yeah? And uh, so some sources uh, fell into the same classification group. So why is that? So for example, here you can take a look at uh, group one, where uh, you can see two cryptographic smart cards, same manufacturer, just different uh, type, and most probably they just share the implementation. And therefore, we can't distinguish between these two, and they are in the same group. Another interesting group is a group uh, 10, where you can see three Microsoft libraries. Uh, once again, we expect that the uh, source code is same for these. But you can also see that the newest version of the Bouncy Castle is there. In that case, a Bouncy Castle, the newest version, is probably not having the exactly same source but it's biasing the public modules in exactly the same way as the Microsoft libraries uh, do. So uh, it's in the same uh, group. 
On the other side, what you can see here is this is the, just the latest version of the bouncy castle. Just the version before that is in a different group. Okay, so even the versions of the library sometimes matter if they are doing changes in the code. And uh, this is, uh, you can plot a dendrogram of Euclidean distances between different groups. And uh, good thing is that we can attribute splits in this uh, dendrogram tree to particular design choices. So it's not some uh, machine learning black magic. We can actually attribute uh, particular differences between groups. So now we have the classification matrix pre-computed once uh, so that we can do the, that, do the classification. So we will take some certificate, extract the uh, public key from that, uh, then apply the mask of known biased bits, get the particle bit value for this particle key, and then just perform table lookup. Very fast uh, operation. And what we will get is the vector of probabilities for different uh, libraries or different groups of libraries. So for this particular key, it might look like this, okay? If you have more than one key, you can get better accuracy. Uh, you can test this uh, by yourself. We publish both data sets and uh, this pre-computed uh, classification matrices, but uh, we also set up a small tool. So, so you can just insert your key or you can insert a URL to a HTTP web server and we will classify this one for you. So just press classify. You will get something like this, where you can see the probabilities and we, you will also see which particle group is not possible. Okay, so, so which particle source can't generate key uh, that you see. So this leads us to classification accuracy. So, so just to give you some feeling what kind of error we can have. So let's assume we have uh, three different sources, uh, and this is the distribution of mask values for these sources. Uh, if you would have one million of uh, keys to classify, and you know that they are all coming from the same source, you can uh, almost perfectly recreate this, uh, uh, this histogram, and then you are sure it was a green source, in this case, OpenJDK, okay? But this is usually not the case. For learning, yes. For classification, no. For classification, you usually have just one, maybe five, ten keys, but not really one million, okay? So, so what is the situation here? We have five keys here, and you will take the first key, apply the mask, you will get particle mask value. And this particle mask value can be generated by all sources. Blue is most probable, but only slightly, and, and the red and green is uh, possible, very, very possible as well. Okay. So uh, we can have the error here. If we will add another key, this one is interesting, because this key, this mask value, uh, is never produced by the red source, in this case, OpenSSL. So we know it can be OpenSSL. Uh, it still can be blue one, but the green one is way more probable. And as you are adding more and more uh, key values, you are more and more sure that it was the green. So this is some basic feeling for error we have. Okay, more keys, better accuracy. So what are the actual re results for the accuracy? To figure out, we set aside uh, 10,000 keys uh, for every source from the learning set. So set aside, so it's fresh keys, and then test it, evaluate the accuracy on that. Uh, so if you have just one key, uh, uh, then uh, your most probable guess after the classification is on average correct with 40% uh, probability. Yeah, you have most probable guess out of 13 possible, and there is, it's 40%, uh, but uh, on average. But there is a high uh, variability here. For some sources with one key, you are almost always wrong. Yeah, it's less than 1%. Uh, for some sources, even one key is, is enough, and you are almost always right, 95%. Uh, if you are fine with a uh, correct guess being within top three, uh, it's 73%. Uh, uh, this is for one key. If you have five keys and you know that these five keys are coming from the same source, then uh, everything is going up. Yeah? The average is 78 now, and within top three, mostly right, 97%. And if you have uh, 10 keys, uh, average uh, for the top first one is uh, 85 and uh, almost always right within top three. Okay, so, so it seems that the accuracy is, is uh, reasonable. 
uh, at least on the test set. So the question is, what with the real world keys? And uh, for that, we have very nice data set. Uh, uh, I like to thank people that, that gather these uh, large data sets. There is EPV for uh, TLS scan with uh, about 10 million unique RSA keys usable for us. Uh, PGP key servers data sets so you can download it. Certificate transparency, transparency database. Once again, nice data sets. There is only one issue. They are not coming annotated which particular key, uh, which particular library generated that key, right? Obviously. Uh, so, but we can do at least some guesses. Uh, first of all, if you are using Apache web server, uh, chances are high that you also use OpenSSL to generate the keys for that. If you are using IIS, then you are probably using Microsoft libraries for that. And the market share for the web servers is somehow known, so a rough estimate can be something like this. OpenSSL, 86%, 12% for the Microsoft. This is some rough estimate, okay? Something remaining for other libraries. Uh, when we took a subset of TLS dataset, where we can batch together keys, uh, which uh, we assume that they are coming from the same source, uh, with the uh, size of 10, but below, at least 10, but below 100 uh, keys, uh, and we batched these keys based on the subject and uh, issue date, we got results like this. Yeah? So OpenSSL 82, Microsoft slightly more than 10, so it's roughly holding, and also the, the blue part, this is a classification for the group, which contains reasonable libraries, like uh, Nettle, Botan, Cryptlib, uh, Wolf SSL, and most importantly, uh, OpenSSL in a FIPS mode. We can distinguish between the OpenSSL and OpenSSL in a FIPS mode. And there is also one person remaining for uh, formerly Paul SSL, now Armbit, uh, Arm Embit, and OpenJDK and Bouncy Castle. So this is sanity check, makes sense, a lot of uh, assumptions, but makes sense. Uh, better sanity check is uh, about the impossible keys. Yeah? Uh, because we know that some sources can't generate or never generate some uh, mask values. Okay, so let's take a look on op OpenSSL and TLS dataset again. And uh, we know that the OpenSSL will never generate keys with the mask values from this particular region. And if we will see the key from this region, we know it can be OpenSSL. So what we can do is take uh, all these large data sets. Big advantage is that now we can work with every single key. Yeah? We can test every single key, whether it's coming from the, possibly coming from the OpenSSL or not. And these are the results. Yeah? The um, column uh, with the percentage of keys that can't be OpenSSL. Uh, so let's start with the third one, which is a TLS data set, ordinary, uh, the internet-wide scan. And uh, about 19% uh, can be from uh, OpenSSL, which leaves uh, the rest that can be OpenSSL, and this is something that holds with uh, the intuition we have. Uh, even better, uh, the Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt data set is just a subset of a TLS data set. Uh, with the certification authority being a Let's Encrypt. And here, it's quite different. Only 1.8 can be from OpenSSL. And this makes perfect sense because uh, OpenSSL is a default client for uh, a Let's Encrypt uh, certification client. And what about something that where you don't expect uh, OpenSSL to be used? PGP key set. You are using GPG or PGP original client, but not really OpenSSL. Uh, so it's very rare here. And here, about 47% uh, can be from OpenSSL. And this is actually very well matching with the baseline, because if something is not used at all, it's roughly for OpenSSL, 50% uh, can be and rest can be. Okay, so this, is, this, this again, holds very well with the intuition we have. Uh, so we believe that works. So what is the impact of this? Uh, this is uh, information disclosure vulnerability. So you may think about that once you are generating your key pair and publishing a public key, you are also adding a sticker saying this key was generated by that particular library, Cryptix, in this sense. So how you can use it and misuse it. Uh, so let's assume that uh, some cryptographic library will turn out to be vulnerable, and because of some implementation error, you can factorize uh, its keys. 
uh, but not for cheap. You need to do a lot of uh, operations. So therefore, you can't just go through the whole TLS data set, all internet web servers, and try to factorize it, uh, because you need to do a lot of operations. But with this information leakage vulnerability, you can just first search for the keys from this library and then factorize it afterwards. Uh, uh, this information leakage is also decreasing your anonymity set. So if you are uh, operating a Tor hidden service, and for some strange reason you are not using the uh, default uh, client as all others, maybe because you like to protect your private keys in a secure hardware, uh, then uh, using this vulnerability, this information disclosure vulnerability, uh, some uh, Tor hidden operators can be linked together because they are using some very, very unusual uh, sources. Another example might be maybe you are using some cryptographic as a service uh, server. They promise that they will generate uh, private keys for you. They will use the private keys for you for signatures. Uh, uh, so you can verify. You can generate a bunch of uh, uh, keys uh, from their service and then ask, uh, is it really some secure hardware or is, is it open SSL instead? And they are lying. Yeah, so it can be used that direction as well. So some compliance. So this leads us to the defense. Uh, what we can do about that? Uh, so there are two lines of defenses here. Uh, first, coming from the developers of these libraries. And in principle, it's simple. Yeah? They just need to unify the way how they are generating RSA keys. But uh, this is probably very hard. I, I don't think this will happen soon. Because at first, they need to agree what is the right way to generate RSA keys. And the uh, second thing is this is, the changes, this is a change. This will require a change in a very critical part of code. Uh, and uh, you will still have legacy binaries and so on. So I believe this uh, vulnerability will stay here for longer. Uh, fortunately, you as the users of the library can defend yourself uh, during the generation of the keys. So what you can do is instead of generating just one key, you can generate multiple keys, let it classify, and then select the one which is least specific. Okay? Uh, and on average, uh, you will just need five keys to generate. Yeah? So it's practical uh, defense. And our tool uh, is trying to help you with that. So if you will put your public key there, uh, we will highlight uh, least specific key for you. So what else? Uh, in a paper, and especially in a technical report, because we, we work with a lot of libraries, so we have a lot of pictures. Uh, so, so take a look in, uh, at the uh, technical report if you are interested. Uh, we provided a summary of uh, RSA key per generation techniques we saw. Uh, we also analyzed random streams coming from the smart cards, and we saw some biases there. Uh, we also uh, identified some systematic defect in uh, generation of uh, public keys on some smart card. Uh, fortunately, uh, this uh, weak, public, uh, weak uh, RSA key was uh, never uh, so in this large data set used in a real world, which is good. And we also do some, did some time and power analysis how the uh, keys are generated on uh, the smart cards. Uh, data sets are available, so, so if you like to play with uh, some machine learning on this, go ahead. Uh, so what are the limitations? Uh, I'd like to highlight three. Uh, so if you have just one key, uh, you can have lower accuracy. Okay, one key is 40% on average on our uh, test set. Uh, for some sources, it's perfectly working. 95% probability for some sources is, is very unspecific. Uh, we can't distinguish mutually all libraries. Yeah, some, some libraries fit within the same uh, group. And uh, although we try to cover a lot of software libraries, some of these, uh, some sources are still missing. We are working on that, most significantly HSMs. Yeah? So, so we still need to gather keys from HSMs. So to conclude, uh, RSA key per generation observably bias public keys, and different libraries bias it differently, and therefore we can distinguish this. Uh, so we can attribute based on a bunch of public keys. We can go back and say which library generated that. Uh, on average, with 10 keys, you are 85% probable, 99 with top three. Uh, for some sources, even one key is enough. Yeah? You can just check the table. Uh, it's information disclosure vulnerability, so you can use it for forensics, de-anonymization, compliance testing. 
And it, uh, it's not that easy to fix from the developer's point of view. So this will probably stay here for longer, but you can defend yourself by generating more keys. So thank you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take it. Uh, hi, Kenny Patterson from Royal Holloway, University of London. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. I was wondering, when you were generating keys from smart cards, mm -hmm. if you ever saw any repeated primes? Repeated primes, no. We never saw that. Um, with one example, one exception, where it was a very weak key. Because it turned out that uh, sometimes the random number generator will fail, and the smart card itself will take the failed value, which was just zeros, uh, figure out that it's not a prime, and then we'll just increment by two, and by two, and two, and it will end up always with the same prime. Yeah. In that case, yes, but uh, in other cases, no. For, for working cards, no. Okay, so it might be interesting to compare your results with a paper published at AsiaCrypt a few years ago mm -hmm. where they were looking at prime generation on smart cards, mm -hmm. and they found uh, in some classes of cards uh, there were repeated primes. Mm -hmm. So it, it perhaps, th I think that was a... Taiwanese government smart cards, yeah, yeah, yeah. if I recall correctly. Yeah, yeah I, I know that paper. Yeah, but, but this was not the case for us. Yeah? Okay. And it was six different manufacturers, but yeah, we had the nice cards. Can I ask one more question? Um, your, your classification um, approach is very interesting. I think it's basically an instance of Bayesian classification. Um, but you're using a uniform prior distribution uh, in your experiments because you have 10 million keys from each class. If you want to assess the true probability, uh, you need to use the correct prior distribution for keys in the wild, and I, that's not, not something you can easily estimate. I wonder how that affects your classification results. Yeah, yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, we thought about that, but the, the issue is that we don't know the prior probability for, for different groups. Yeah. So therefore, we, we opted to, stay to, to, to keep the prior probability exactly the same, and then see whether this will work. And then because it, it matched the web server's uh, market share, so we believe even that it works. Yeah? But, but this is hard to obtain the, the a priori probabilities. But on the other side, if you have some additional knowledge and you know these probabilities, definitely you can do better. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.